Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Happy Tuesday. Today is Tuesday, um, a day we haven't seen before, but it's an exciting day just because we are here for a conversation with the one and only Dr. Anthony Andrews. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being punctual. Uh, you know, as we transition to this, this no normal world that we're living in where video is... Um, the thing we do more frequently than in person, especially with what's going on, uh, coming here on time really means a lot. It really helps us with this conversation. So I won't spend much time you know, speaking about anything else except getting to our candidate, the candidate here, the Honorable Dr. Anthony Andrews. Good evening, Dr. Andrews. Good evening, Jermaine, how are you? Um, I am well, I am well, I'm really excited for this conversation just because there are a lot of subjects that we have to dive into, have to talk about, just because our community, um, you know, we really, we really need a level of leadership um, right now. But before we get into those type of details, the important, the really, really important stuff, there is some other important stuff that I'd really like to um, discuss. First, um, we're going to jump into your backstory, hear a little bit about where you come from, um, what ex some experiences that you've had, because I believe that that kind of informs the person that you are. And then the second thing is, uh, for this conversation, if you are able to view it in the chat, there's a link to um, sequence the podcast. And on there, there's an interview with Dr. Andrews that gives a lot more detail on the backstory on the actual work that you were doing. Actually, this was recorded a year and a half ago, but the work, you know, remains consistent from then and, and years before. But, you know, you can click on that link, everyone in the Zoom, feel free to click on that link when you have an opportunity after this conversation to really get a good grasp of um, of, of Dr. Andrews and who he is. But to that point, Dr. Andrews, tell us a little bit, a lot of bit about yourself, your upbringing, and, um, and how it informs who you are today. So, so Jermaine, you know, I, and first of all, I'm glad you brought the podcast up because the podcast was an excellent opportunity for me to talk to, not just to talk to you, but talk to residents throughout Southeast Queens about who I am and, and what I was thinking about doing, some of the ideas I have for really moving this community forward. As you know, I was born in South Jamaica, um, grew up with a teenage mother, um, single parent, I'm born in Jamaica Hospital, in fact. Um, Thugton Boulevards off 119th Avenue. Uh, and that's where I grew up, spent most of my life in Jamaica, in the area. Uh, and, you know, I grew up in a household which was middle income, but my mother um, was, um, was, was obviously, as a teenage mother, it was very difficult for her to raise three kids. Um, she started out as a teenage mother, had two other kids. And here's a woman who did all of this with the help of public assistance and the help of her parents. Um, so we grew up um, not having much, uh, really not having much at all. And uh, you know, in this community in South Jamaica, uh, in the area I grew up, it was not an easy community to grow up in. It was tough. There were choices that you had to make. Um, I was thankful that Tom White, the 
Democratic district leader uh, before me and the city council person, um, and Juanita Watkins, the other city council person. From the time of, um, I guess, the time I was 18 years old um, until the time they passed away, they both mentored me, took me under their wing, and, and really worked to, to make sure that I didn't stray. Because I could have strayed. Growing off Sutton Boulevard, I certainly could have strayed. Certainly going to go in a different way. Had plenty of opportunities to do that. But they kept me involved with the Democratic Club. They kept me involved with politics. And Tom Lake pushed me to get a degree. And I went for my bachelor's degree. And Tom Lake pushed me to get a master's degree. And one of the black people encouraged it also. Before you knew it, I was um, a young man who was going through um, the process of getting my high school diploma after getting kicked out of high school. Um, had been involved with uh, things that I probably shouldn't have been involved with at that time and didn't have much use for school. But Tom White wanted to watch this, stayed with me, didn't let go of me, held on to me, kept me under their wing, and made sure that I went through school, went through to get my bachelor's from York College, and even pushed me and encouraged me to go for my master's at Peru College, which you know a little something about. Yes, I know a little bit of something about that. I mean, thank, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that um, a little bit more about, about your backstory. Uh, fellow Jamaica Hospital um, Borney, if that's a word, <laughs> Borney here as well, so we can represent that. Um, I, uh, let's let's just do a little housekeeping though um, as well, because um, right now, just so that everyone knows, the cameras are off except for um, our the our candidate here that we're meeting that we're hearing from in, in my screen. I'll try to take mine off as much as possible so that we can focus on, you know, the word and the message and the information that Dr. Andrews is sharing with us. Um, that's one thing. And the next thing is that, uh, so if there's any limitations or if you feel like you can't be heard, there will be space at the end of this conversation, there will be space for questions. We're gonna take questions because I'd love to hear from the, what looks like 27 people in, in, in the crowd right now, and it's still early. I'd love to hear some really poignant questions, really um, get, making our candidate uh, answers, what, what the things that are on your mind and on your concerns, et cetera. So, um, so thank you all for joining once again. The link was put up for the podcast so you can hear even more of Dr. Andrews backstory um, because that was just a little taste a little taste for you know a, 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 a long life I'm not calling you you know you know a long life a long experienced life yes sir um, but that was a little bit about the backstory now something that's very near and dear to my heart and it's just a, a concept that's just been said throughout the years and people just kind of use it as as you know a throw-in but leadership the idea of leadership um, Explain to me uh, some of your leadership experiences, whether that's you know, specifically in the community, but you know, impacting lives. What what experiences have you had in the in the realm of leadership that you believe that would prepare you for this position that you're seeking as assembly member from um, the district? So, and I hope I'm coming across clearly now because I saw something in the chat says I wasn't coming across too clearly. So, I'm hoping I'm coming across more clearly now. Um, so, I started out as a Democratic State Committee person, uh, ran on the slate of white, polite Andrews, Tom White, and myself ran on the same slate. I ran for a vacant state committee spot that was Council Member Tom White's spot before he became the district leader. And I became the Democratic district leader. We ran against the organization at the time, the Democratic organization, for these positions. And I was successful with winning the Democratic State Committee position. In fact, I became the youngest elected Democrat in the history of New York State in 1988, actually. So you talk about my storied history, and of course, not mentioning my age, but yes, it has been a long time. Um, I started out in that role, and then I became the president of the Young Democrats Organization. I became the first Black to become president of the Young Democrats Organization. I believe that was in 1990. And as a friend of mine reminded me the other day, I was keynote speaker at the Democratic Party and second lieutenant governor's nomination uh, in successive years in the early 1990s. So I became a leader in the Democratic Party. And Tom White and Juanita Watkins, and I want to continue to stress because I want to give credit where credit is due, because there are a lot of stories out there about who mentored me and who talked to me. For those who've known me and who have been around me for years, you know that Tom White and Juanita Watkins were the people who mentored me from the 1980s. Um, I may have worked with other people, I may have dealt with other people, but I have to give credit to Tom White and Juanita Watkins. Again, we moved from that point 
as a Democratic State Committee person to my involvement in the community. I served on many nonprofit boards. I served as the treasurer of the Jamaica Center for Arts and Learning. I uh, served on the board there. Um, also served on the uh, Queens Hospital Center Advisory Board for close to two decades. Um, and during that time, I served many terms as the chairperson of the Queens Hospital Community Advisory Board. And also served as a labor leader, a delegate for the New York State Union of Teachers and also the Professional Staff Congress and also American Federation of Teachers. So I served in labor leadership, not just at York College, but for the city university as a whole. And then of course, uh, my faith-based work, a uh, member of uh, St. Clement Pope Church. Uh, my family helped to organize and found Rush Temple Church. And um, I'm the area deputy for the Knights of Peter Clayton Lane Missouri. And that's a very, very prominent position. I'm very proud of that position because I want to organize the, uh, the members of the Knights and Ladies and also to recruit people for the work that I do in the church. You know, I, I, I think I may have made a mistake. I mean, you know, we're, we're talking about leadership here and I didn't put a cap on the amount of things that you can share with us just because I know, you know, we could really be here all day just knowing how much work you've been doing in the community for such a long time. And, um, and uh, so I, I learned, I've learned my lesson. I've learned my lesson. But um, let's jump. Let's jump into some of the subjects. Some of the subjects, and 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 uh, a part of me wants to start at the idea of um, economic development. Uh, you know, when you when we speak about economic development and what it means for our community, it really is you know an engine. I'd love for you to to hear from you some of your ideas about what it will take for us in our communities to get real, true economic development. So you know, one of the things I talk about, especially when I'm on the doors, and we've knocked on six thousand five hundred doors already. Um, I have personally, so I've talked to people about developing the economic strips, and I've talked to them about the economic corridors that we have, Sutton Boulevard, Guy Brewer Boulevard, Rockaway Boulevard, and how I want to look more like Merrick Boulevard from Mer uh, and Baisley down to the Cross Island Parkway. You know, our strip doesn't look anything like that for the most part. So in order to develop an economic engine, you have to get businesses. You have to get businesses that want to come to be a part of those economic corridors. But in order to do that, we have to do some things. You know, we have to expand government financing for MWBs and... Uh, to allow them to help compete for multi-million dollar contracts. And we have to streamline the payments for MWBs. Um, a lot of them are subcontracted by larger contractors and they have cash flow problems. Um, due to bureaucratic shortfalls, they're not able to get the financing they need and sometimes not able to get the money they need to be able to put the money forth to be able to do the work from these major contractors. But of course to do this because how else do you get the contract unless you subcontract? Some of the ideas I have, creating tax-free Tuesdays, um, implementing a weekly sales tax holiday, right? On products and services that you might pay for at your local store. Um, creating sales tax exemption areas um, in struggling communities, areas that need to have um, no sales tax so that we can force the economic development. You know, I wanna increase seed capital loans uh, from, uh, you know, the state and the city, of course, bank development districts, expanding low interest financing and microloans, of course. Um, those are big things I want to do. You know, <laughs> once again, a lot of stuff here, but uh, I, I just going back, I think the, the tax free Tuesdays idea is a um, a little bit, it's groundbreaking, you know, just because of what we've seen and how that can essentially stimulate the economy of those same corridors that you're speaking about to get them to get them looking right. If people know that they're not going to be paying taxes instead of buying on Amazon, we can go to the mom and pop store. So, you know, I applaud you for such a great idea. And, well, well, and I can't take credit for that, Jermaine. That's uh, Mayor Eric Adams' idea. So I'm on board with it. But I certainly can't take credit for it. That's yeah. Exactly okay. It. All right. Well, you, you know what? You, you signed on, right? Yeah. I yeah. And, bring that, and then bringing that to our communities would be critical, Absolutely. right? To what to what it is that um that we would hope to see. So um you know just to, just oh let's just run back because I know a lot of people just joined. Um, our cameras, everyone else's cameras are off right now and, and, um, and you're muted because we're really going to be locking in on this conversation with Dr. Andrews, um, hearing some of his ideas. We had a little, heard a little bit about the backstory. We heard a little bit um, about economic development and what that would look like in our communities. 
um, and, and some really you know, great ideas. I think uh, the thing that a lot of people are missing, you know, just in general in politics is, you know, ideas, real ideas that can actually come to fruition that has a start point and end point and accountability to it, not because, you know, it's just something you say, but instead something that you can actually see happen. With that being said, um, something very near and dear to my heart as I've been working with young people for the past 15 years. I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about some of those kind of plans that you have, some of those ideas that you have that you can see, you know, happen over time and with work and energy that you would put in at, on the assembly representing the district um, with relation to youth development and education, a very important subject just because of our young people and what they mean to our future. So if you can just dig in a little bit on that, we'd love to hear a little bit. So I'll see if I can touch on it a little bit. Um... So one of the things I've talked about when we've gone through the community is I want to make sure that we do some stuff like expanding vocational training. You know, we used to have shop classes in school. We grew up, we had vocational training. A lot of young people didn't go to college, but they were able to learn the trade and they were able to use that trade to become gainfully employed, start their own businesses. Um, you know, I want to see if we can, and speaking of that, I want to see if we can get some of these young people who might want to start their own businesses to actually begin to start their businesses in a business incubator. Something we talked about for years, um, a place where people can share goods and services and the resources will be provided so they can grow their businesses, so they can become strong enough. And when, after a few years, they become strong enough, we can move them onto the economic corridors like Sutton Boulevard or Rockley Boulevard or Guybro Boulevard. Uh, right now, we don't have anything like that, but vocational training is big for me. So I wanna be able to see if we can teach our young people trades. Um, I want to say we can also do something, and one of the things, as you know, Jermaine, I've done my doctorate in executive leadership, so my strength is teaching young people how to become leaders in society, not just in high school or college, but in society. So I want to say we can do some of those things by training young people, not just in vocational skills, but training them to be leaders in every endeavor they decide to be a part of, right? I want to see if we can then, we can make as far as I'm concerned, in order to get students in school, a lot of our students are having trouble with financing. If they don't receive financial aid, they have loans. We have so many students at York College who are actually forced to choose between a meal and actually car fare to get to college. They choose to, they're forced to choose between buying books and eating dinner. So I wanna see if we can make CUNY and SUNY 100% tuition free. I like the concept of CUNY New Deals. I love the fact that if we can go back to where we were when we first started CUNY and SUNY, by making it free for students, our students will no longer be forced to choose between hunger and going to school to get an education. I wanna see if we can also expand support services to struggling students by establishing paid student mentors made up of upperclassmen on campus. We can use this money also to hire more mental health counselors and academic advisors for support services, which is what's needed. But student mentoring has been shown throughout many studies to be one way that students can not only excel but persist in academics throughout college. Peer-to-peer -peer mentoring is actually sometimes better than mentoring from a traditional, a more traditional older mentor because students can hear from somebody who's closer to the age and somebody who understands a little bit better what they may be going through at that period of time in their life. So, you know, um, the, the conversation, you know, around uh, the, the, the young people at York having to decide between books and, and a meal really resonates. You know, I, I, I work with foster care youth that have that same story and, and it's not, um, it's not uncommon. It's very it's something that happens on a regular basis. But speaking of the vocational programming and what value that would bring to our community, just knowing how much you know debt we take on um, going to college and, and, and some people that really have a desire. So I really think those are such great, great, great points. Um, but uh, you know, to that point, 
Um, you know, there's there's an organization, Life Camp. They do a lot of great work. The violence interrupters stepping in. They're they're you know they're pretty much the hot ticket on the block right now when it comes to funding federally, statewide, you know, locally. Um, I think they are a part of the puzzle. But tell me a little bit about um, how you see criminal justice. Um, um, in, in a time where there has been an uptick, and, and just my final point before you go, there was a young man that was killed um, uh, on Guy Brewer and Foch. And this, I, I, I've heard that he's very you know, active in the community. He knows a lot of people. He was a good guy and he was murdered um, down the block. For me, um, you know, there's still a memorial uh, for a young man that was killed a few months ago as well. What is it? What are some of your ideas where do you see criminal justice for our community, especially in this time where we're starting to see an uptick? So first of all, let me say, I have a great relationship with the 103rd and 113 precincts, uh, the commanders and the officers there. When I go and speak to the officers there, and I'm one of the few elected officials that actually, uh, they invite to come in and speak to the officers there. Um, when I go and speak to the officers, I talk to them about how important it is for us to have a relationship with the community and the police departments. I want them to serve and protect and respect our community, but we want to support our officers. In fact, most of the people I speak to in the community, they don't want less officers. They want more officers, right? They're not talking about defunding the police. They're talking about making sure that we have more officers. But again, we want officers that respect, protect, and serve. Want to see if we can expand funding for? I'm sorry, Jermaine. You want to jump in? Yeah, no, I want to jump in there. So I mean, so let's just get to it, right? Like right to it. So you are not for defunding the police? No, I, I, and again, I don't think most people in our community support right. it. That's it. Um, and I think you know people talked about well, it really didn't mean to fund all the police, but it meant to share services, share some of the money, and and to bring some more services, wraparound services to what we were doing with police. Well, that's great, right? But I think the whole concept. That name, the phrase to fund the police, just set a lot of people up in our community. Like, no, we don't need less police. We need more police, right? Sure, we need more funding for crisis management teams, right? Sure, we need more funding for mental health and first responders. We also would like maybe to establish a firm New York City residence requirement for NYPD officers. A lot of officers of color have thought that that might help, in fact. Um, and, but we want to focus deterrence, right? We want to have focused deterrence. So that means we want to do is a two-part crime prevention strategy. Police aggressively learning and pursuing the leads that they have about the criminals that come in there. Finding those people who are more likely to commit those crimes and to be able to catch them before they commit those crimes again, right? Studies have shown that the, the, the bulk of crimes in the community are not committed by so many people. They're committed by very select few people. Um, and so we've got to have focused deterrence. Um, I also think that there's some things that we can do that will make it easier, which I think are part of a social justice strategy. See, my doctorate is in executive leadership, looking at the role of the prison of social justice. Mm. For those who are low income, we need to allow them to have unpaid fines or fees. Volunteer, let them volunteer to pay their debt to community service with a refundable minimum wage per hour. So we get them to do community service, right? Or basically we get them to perform service out in the community, not just cleaning streets. They can be doing any number of things, right? Any number of jobs that we need to have done in this community to support, to supplement the city workers that we have, right? And then we pay them as opposed to trying to, to find them and to make sure that they have fines that they can never repay. And then if they don't repay them, then say they are outstanding fines, we wanna arrest them. What we want to do is we want to do something else, give them an opportunity to do something for the community, pay them for that, and allow that to be part of the fine process, as opposed to charging them a fine, which they could probably never pay. They may not be able to pay at all. So uh, once again, a lot to unpack there, but there was something at the beginning that you said about your relationship with the 103rd. Um, I've seen this in person where we're walking somewhere, you know, I think we were going to the carnival on Jamaica Avenue. And, um, you know, it was like almost every officer there was like, Dr. Andrews, you know, and, and greeting you. What do you think that, that that kind of relationship means for 
community leadership, but then also the community where, um, you know, it, it, it uh, what do you think it means, you know, essentially in, in navigating um, better relationships? You know, I think it's important, Jermaine. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's extremely important. Um, so the relationship that we have right now is one of mutual respect. They understand that I want to work with them, and I just want them to, again, as I continue to say, my phrase is protect, respect, and serve. And they have no problem. Most of the offices are good offices. They want to be in this community because that's what they want to do. In fact, they're happy that they were assigned to South Jamaica, to Rochdale Village and the surrounding area, because they say, hey, this is where we're going to be able to make a difference, right? I think it's important to have that respect from the commanding offices, because now we're able to work together and to trust each other. If there are things that I know that are going in the community, and we can work together on folks deterrence, then I think that's important. If you don't have that trust, there's no way you're going to be able to work together to get rid of some of the people that are doing the bulk of the crimes to make sure that these guys get addressed. And there's no way you're gonna be able to address situations which could become very explosive before they become explosive. It's great that we have uh, kill violence programs like King of Kings Foundation um, and some of the others. But it's extremely important that we also have a good working relationship with the police departments. Community policing is important, but if they don't have a community partnership working with the people in the community, to see what the issues are, where they need to be addressed, then it's not helpful. You've got to have a partnership. And I think the respect that I have from these guys and the respect that I have for the guys who are running the show, because we're able to work together on projects and initiatives, I think is extremely important for a partnership that will benefit the community as a whole. Yeah, um, you know, that, that that really hits the nail on the head just because when we're talking about the, the police officers knowing the community and having those community relationships and community policing, it does do a different, um, it does make it feel a lot different uh, in that world, in that society. Um, that's very real and, and attainable. Um, and I'm glad that that's a, a platform of yours. Um, let's, let's pivot to uh, mental health as first responders, you know, um, you know, my early days, uh, you know, just understanding how many police officers, you know, are called into um, mental health crisis and what that means. Um, tell us a little bit about um, where, where you feel like there's an opportunity here for uh, professionals to step in and really help in this area. You know, I mentioned that a little bit earlier, today. you know, we want to have crisis management teams, right? We want to be able to fund crisis management teams. I believe that there's a there's a place for crisis management teams to be on the scene with the police officers. A lot of times things escalate because the law offices that are there, they're used to trying to prevent crime and to stop crime as it's being committed. Sometimes that's not the case. There's just somebody who's disturbed, somebody who's maybe emotionally disturbed or may have some mental issues. And so you need somebody to be there that is trained as a professional to assist with that before it escalates and becomes a situation where it becomes violent where the police feel that they need to take action. And I want to see if we can expand funding for mental health first responders in particular, because a lot of the issues that we see played out on the front pages of the newspapers, on the internet, on social media, are issues that are happening because you don't have somebody there who's trained to deal with people of a mental health crisis. It could be in the street. It could be on the train. Whether we're talking about people who are homeless, we're talking about people who just have problems in their family and their family doesn't know how to address it or assist them with their issues. And so the family then calls the cops because the situation comes, becomes out of control. That's where you need these mental health first responders. Yeah, yeah, hundred um, percent. You know, those, those, many of the calls, just looking at the, the data around that, it's, it's really shocking. So that's a, you know, I think it's a wonderful um, touch point and a jump point for us. Um, you know, there is a conversation that's been going on. I know you referred to it a little bit earlier, but uh, but I'm going to just, you know, I'm taking a little notes here on my iPad, and I just want to circle back to some of these, like, very poignant things that you just, you know, pulled out. Um, one being the New York City residence requirement for police officers. We're, like, expand on that for us. Give us a little bit more of your vision with that and what that would mean for our communities. So, you know, this is not necessarily a very popular thing with the law enforcement community, a lot of people in the law enforcement community. 
I've talked to a lot of fraternal orders, and they feel that it could be helpful. I mean, the bottom line is, we want people that can identify with the people who live in the community because they live in the city, right? They understand this, right? We're not talking about the people who've been out there already. You can't, and obviously, may not be able to grandfather this, right? So people who are already on the force, they're going to live where they live. But I think, certainly, there's a, a real case to be made that you can have people who live in the city, right, who are now becoming law enforcement officers, who understand the communities which they serve better because they live here. There's a strong case that can be made for that. Um, unfortunately, we've had some officers that, that have passed away, been killed in a lot of duty. Let's just call it what it is. And these officers in the past few months, there was an officer who grew up in the Bronx, wanted to become a police officer. Um, knew that he wanted to become a police, police officer because of things he saw in his community. Um, his family, very proud of him, very proud member of that community, um, and served the police officer as well. Unfortunately, the situation occurred, he was killed. But this, this young man took great pride in policing communities like his. And he understood how to deal with issues in a different way, especially because some of the young men and women who we policed in those communities, he understood how they thought and how they reacted to certain things because he was one of those young men like that in a community much like theirs. I think that's extremely important. Um, Eric Adams talked about the fact that he wanted to become a police officer because he was roughed up uh, badly as a young man, as a teenager. They said he wanted to become a police officer because he wanted to make sure that he treated young men with the respect that he would have liked to have had that day. And that he was somebody who could exemplify what a true officer who was policing and protecting a community should be. And that was what forced him to really think hard about becoming a police officer. And really what eventually propelled him to a life of public service and eventually become the mayor of New York City. Had he not been that young man who was uh, in that situation and who that occurred to, it may have changed his whole way of thinking and may not have, you know, set him on the path that he has been set on. And he may certainly have not become the mayor of New York City. So I think there's a lot of merit to requiring new officers uh, have a residency requirement for new officers. A lot of merit to it. Yeah, hundred percent. Totally, totally uh, see that. I will say, uh, well, speaking of Eric Adams, um, you know, there is, there was, well, no, let me do a little housekeeping. Thank you all for joining. We have a good number of you here. Just a reminder, screens are off. Um, you know, your screens are off and your mics are muted. We do have a space at the end of this conversation and we are doing very good on time, very good on time. So I want to make sure that, you know, we leave some um, some space because it's a really tight packed program and I know we have a lot more to get to, but I want to make sure that there's space in there for, for um, an opportunity for those that are here to ask questions. Um, at some point, you know, you feel free to start typing them into the chat if you'd like to and we can circle back to them uh, so that, you know, we can get Dr. Andrews on the record talking about some of these important things that are impacting our communities on a day to day basis. Thank you all for joining. Thank you all for um, listening in on, on our Meet the Candidates night conversation. But speaking of Eric Adams, you know, about a month ago, I saw a nice photo op that happened um, with uh, our city council member, the speaker, uh, you know, a few other uh, electeds from New York City, and they were speaking about the Habitat for Humanity project that was happening in, uh, in our community where, you know, they were flipping a few um, homes that was actually owned by the city, making it sustainable for, you know, real low income um, housing with, you know, with energy prices that are reasonable because it's solar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, a, a novel idea, but it was eight homes. I mean, you know, what's eight homes in a, in a, in a community that has so many, uh, so many people living there in, in ours. Um, speak to me a little bit about you know, your housing plan, right? Southeast Queens essentially is still a foreclosure capital of New York City. We know this, left and right, you know, foreclosures are happening. Um, 
You know, we're, we're facing an affordable housing crisis many years ago. You know, someone said, a candidate for governor said, um, the rent's too damn high. You know, the rent is too damn high. And, and that was the party. And, um, and, and, and that, that, that same story resonates and, and remains till this day. So talk, talk, to, talk to us about the record high rent prices. How will you combat this? What is your plan to make sure that um, our community can come out of this hole? Well, first of all, we, we need to redefine the area of median income, right? To determine affordable housing income criteria. Um, right now, uh, you know, we're included in areas outside of New York City, of course, that makes it indeterminable. So we look at our community and say, this is including South Jamaica. Uh, and areas within South Jamaica have some of the lowest poverty indexes in the country. And yet it's included in and lumped in with areas outside of New York City, which have some of the higher incomes in the country. You can't be lumped in. You can't put two, you can't put this area and, and those areas together. So we need to redefine the area of media income. Um, because that defines affordable housing, right? The median income becomes obviously because of the high income areas a little bit higher, which is not necessarily so for people in the income that live in Jamaica, right? So we're going to need to do that. Right? And then also, that's one of the things I talk about when I go out and I knock on doors and talk to residents about. One of the other things I talk to residents about, of course, is in terms of building truly affordable housing here in this community, right? How we need to build truly affordable housing. We'll be able to do that once we can redefine the area of median income. Property taxes is another issue. It's not just the rent. It's not just people, you know, uh, getting co-ops and condos in this area and saying that it's, it's, the rent is too high. Um, uh, the lease, that I'm, the amount that I'm paying per month on my lease is too high. It's also housing, period. I mean, we have houses that are now being built. They're knocking down houses or purchasing houses, some of the developers. At $100,000, $150,000, $200,000, and rebuilding on the same property, not just two families, but one family at twice that amount. Housing is too high, right? One of the things that I talk to residents about, and one of the things I hear most in parts of the district, is that the income tax is too high. So I began to do some research, right, with our team on income taxes in our community in South East Queens. We have some of the highest income tax, property taxes, I should say, property taxes, let's talk about that. Not income tax, property tax. Some of the highest property taxes in the city. So as I talk to them about the property tax, and I talk to them about why it's so high, we then begin to talk about other areas of New York City, just for comparison's sake, right, Jermaine? You know, we're paying more in South Jamaica than people in Belrose. Now, obviously, people in Belrose have much higher incomes than people in South Jamaica. So why are we paying more in property tax than people in Belrose? Wow. We are, in fact, paying more in property tax in this district than people in Park Slope, where the millionaires live. I've talked to um, the former mayor about this. I've mentioned this to him. And he laughed and he said, he laughed and he said, you're right, we need to do something about it. Had a Zoom meeting with the governor not too long ago. And I said to the governor in this Zoom meeting with a number of us, I said, Governor, what are we going to do about the property tax issue? Because my people should not be paying more than the millionaires at Park Slope. And she said, you know what? You're absolutely right. It's something we need to address. And I'm going to see if I can address it this year and see if we can get it done. And I thought to myself, is that, and I said, so we're talking about addressing it in the future? And she said, well, I'm going to see if I can do it this, this year. I'm going to see if I can address the budget this year. And I said, so the only way out of this for our community is to have somebody advocating and fighting for this past this year. Because there was no commitment that this was going to be more than one year. Now, the property tax rebate, including the budget, is a one-time provision this year, just as the governor promised. But what about next year? Right. What about the year afterwards? So again, we've got to have somebody up there fighting for it. To this point, we haven't had anybody in the state fighting for it. But we've got to have somebody fighting for it. And that means somebody who understands what that means 
for the residents. And for the residents in our community, sometimes it's a matter of having a home and not having a home. A lot of our seniors say they can't pay the property taxes down. The property taxes have become too cumbersome, just too much. There are seniors that will be out on the street in a year because they can't keep up with their property taxes. One of the biggest issues we have in this community are seniors who are now unable to live in affordable, supposedly affordable housing, and who now are gonna be on the street. And one of the biggest issues that nobody talks about in our community is the amount of homeless seniors. That's gonna be greater if we can't fix this property tax issue. We have a big problem with homelessness also. People talk about homelessness along the strips, in particular, Sutton Boulevard getting closer to the Long Island Railroad. Big issue. Not only do we have a lot of shelters that are being built in our community, but I think that's not the way to go. We need to see if we can redirect the homeless shelter funding to transitional housing vouchers. Let's get people in homes. Let's choose these vouchers not to put them in shelters, but to put them in homes. And then let's give them the wraparound services, the social services that they need to become gainfully employed and to be able to address if there are any issues, mental or emotional issues, to help them address those issues within the family. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, thank you for advocating for the community um, with the governor, bringing those type of issues to the table um, and trying to get her to uh, understand uh, the commitment level that's going to take because that's an equity issue, you know that's an equity issue and um and it's and it, and it's important that you know we have we had you at that moment fighting and advocating for the community. This is something that could be happening every day with you as assembly member. So um so thank you for that and we hope to see that happening you know in the future. Um, I mean if I could just piggyback on that just really quick just to sure. well, just to talk about this. So we talk about homes, we talk about the homelessness, and, and quite often what gets left out of this conversation is NYCHA. People have no idea how many NYCHA properties I have in this district, right? So as a Democratic district leader, you know, I look at one side of the district, which is the other side, this side of London Boulevard towards the conduit, and I think to myself, okay, well, I have basic houses there, right? Right next door to Cedar Manor, which is a cooperative development. But I didn't realize that on the other side of the district, the other side of Linden Boulevard, I have several New York City Housing Authority complexes, several. And the one thing that I want to do for those residents is to make sure that if they're living in city housing, that we fully fund the New York City Housing Authority. Something people have talked about for years, but there's got to be a concerted effort and somebody advocating for those residents in the New York City Housing Authority. I can't tell you how many properties I've gone into where they talk about the lack of maintenance, right? Um, they talk about the pipes that are busted. Sometimes some of the residents said they've even had to fund their own repairs because the repairs weren't adequately done in the New York City Housing Authority. NYCHA has never been fully funded. It's almost as if it's just been left there. The New York City Housing Authority has just been left and okay, it is what it is. We just have to kind of maintain it. And so we hear these stories about the, the heat being off. Um, we talk about, the repairs not being done. We have the Shelton houses, South Jamaica houses, Baisley houses. We have all these housing complexes in this district. And they all have the same issues, inadequate care, inadequate maintenance. And then when maintenance needs to be done, not really good maintenance. One woman said she has her son come over to fix the plumbing. And her son comes over to do the plastering with the holes. Her son comes over to do she spends her money in a New York City Housing Authority complex just to make sure that this apartment looks decent so she can feel comfortable with her family living there. No money gets reimbursed to her, but this is just so she feels comfortable. So we've got a fully fund night shift, and we've got to properly support the needs of the residents there. Yeah, you know that's a that's definitely a marginalized community in terms of the representation that that they get at uh, with NYCHA, um, and that is a whole dissertation level kind of um, you know thing to get that you know that fixed 
uh, and, and operating and functioning in a, in a way that's uh, respectable to human beings that live there. So thank you for bringing that up, you know, and, and, and you know, keeping that a part of your ideas. You know, when I, I just, you know, just a little bit, but I, the one thing I'm very, uh, I admire a lot about your campaign thus far is just this idea of ideas, you know, ideas and ideas and, and just bringing these fresh perspectives to, um, to the community, to what we see on a regular basis, um, uh, which isn't much, but, um, you know, what, what we hope to gain uh, with you taking um, the, the or, or having the role of assembly member representing the district. Um, and, you know, we've gone over, we've talked about, let me see, what was my subject points here? We had, um, you know, the leadership experience that you've gone through and you're just explaining um, your, you know, your backstory before that, and then your work at your, co your college, um, you know, your, your, how active you are as district leader on the different community advisory boards of the Queens Hospital Center, et cetera. We talked about economic development a little bit. Um, in, de in, the, in detail, actually, there was several ideas on that, you know, to pick from just focusing on the corridor and getting people there, which is, you know, an awesome idea. Um, and then we spoke about youth development and education. I'm going to circle back to that in a second. Um, and then we just we just really got into criminal justice, especially with the uptick in what's happening right now, and and um, and ideas that really surround um, not taking away power from the police officers, but empowering them to be more a part of the community, which I think is essential and important. And then you know just speaking about housing, and there's a hyper focus from what I was gaining. Um, from you, which speaking about our seniors and speaking about people in NYCHA and speaking about the state's involvement and making sure that you know we're taken care of. But work with me um, as we go back to my kind of uh, you know touch point, my my you know, my heart, and then I'll take this point of personal privilege just because I'm hosting this conversation. But um, youth development and education, um, you know. Uh, Education is so important to our young people. You know that as you know, working in um, a collegiate setting and understanding, you, you understand that. Tell me a little bit about, um, you know, there are left back a grade and, you know, young people that are just kind of, um, you know, bought through the system, not getting the services they need. Tell me a little bit about some of your plans that you would have and not specifically about that, but just about education and as a whole what you believe should be happening, can be happening, that will impact us on a day-to-day um, -day basis? Well, you know, I'd say, let me take a point of personal privilege also to, um, we talked about the court system and things that were going on in the court system, and of course, criminal justice and everything else. Just a um, point of personal privilege to mention, we have State Appellate Court Judge Gary Moret on the line, and also soon to be Judge uh, Tom Oliva, who also members of our club, who I think are gonna be, uh, who is also, I think, gonna be an excellent judge um, somebody that understands our community and understands that when people walk through the door, um, how they should be treated by a jurist. Um, and that's important. That's the social justice component of things that I think about and look at. Uh, how are people treated when they walk through that door, right? Uh, of a courtroom. Anyway, let me just, I digress for a second. So let me go back to our young people and, and educating. Key for me is that there are several components to getting young people of color, young black and brown men in particular, um, who have the lowest um, achievement rate and the lowest persistence, academic persistence rate of any race genders in America. That's black and Latino males. They have the most difficult time getting out of high school, the most difficult time getting out of college. And afterwards, therein lies the problem because they have the most difficult time becoming gainful employed because they have a lack of college degrees, right? At one time, we had more black and brown men in jail than in college. No more. We have a little bit more now in college than we do in jail, but it shouldn't be comparable. So how do we get these young black and brown men to persist, right? So my doctorate focuses on leadership training, but what my studies and research have also shown that there are some things that help these young men persist through high school and into college and through college. Mentoring is a key component. And I'm sure you know that JSS, working with 
the foster care system. You understand how important mentoring is. All of my research says that young men were mentored. And it doesn't matter by which color, by who mentors them. Um, could be a professor, could be a, a parent, could be a educator um, who is in high school with them, but could just be a clergyman. Young men who are mentors have a better chance of persisting academically. Another thing that I've, I've seen that is uh, something that my studies have shown. Young men who, of course, receive leadership training. Leadership training helps bring out the best in a lot of these young men. Um, young men who receive some leadership training at some level tend to persist greater academically. I also see things um, with young men who are working together, learning how to become part of a team. That assists some of these young men with persisting also. Something about young men working together and supporting each other, peer support. And that's why I talked about the peer mentoring program. And it doesn't have to come to peer mentoring necessarily from a young man, but it helps when it comes to a young man who is also excelling and doing well in school. But it could come from a young, a young woman, obviously. But peer mentoring is key also, not just, you know, support from one mentor, but a group of peers, right? Those are just some things that I found that help our young men and women, but in particular our young men of color, to persist at greater levels through high school and through college. Yeah, I, I, I can, you know, vouch for that dissertation accuracy or um, importance right there. Not that it needs my, you know, um, <laughs> uh, backing, but 100% that, you know, mentoring what it does, um, because there's some value in the peer to peer. So um, uh, thank you for bringing that up and speaking about that and what that means for youth development, what that means for education. Now my point of personal privilege, just because of how important that subject is. But let's just jump into um, one of my final, my last topic that I wanted to speak about before I open up the floor to some questions. Um, so if everyone, at some point, we're going to open up the, um, the room so people can unmute themselves and, uh, and we'll call on you and give you the mic so that you can ask a question. But my last question is about senior citizens. Um, and I saved senior citizens last just because um, it's such an important subject. Uh, you know, the people that have kind of laid the path for us need, I believe, the most amount of attention from us doing our part to take care of them. Um, I was raised by my grandmother and my great grandmother, so I understand and I feel it. And, and that's why I want to ask you this question. Um, you know, we have a natural occurring retirement. I know you touched on it a little bit um, about what our seniors are going through, having to pay in those NYCHA buildings, et cetera. Um, but specifically in Rochdale, Right, specifically in Rochdale, is a naturally occurring retirement community there. Um, how do you plan to provide more support? Uh, some people would say support, but how would you provide? How would you plan to provide more support um, for our seniors? Well, there are some things that they need, right, and things that we talk about all the time um, when I talk to our seniors. First of all, let me just say how important um, seniors are to me, not only in my platform, but in everything that I do in my life. Um, as you know, and as I talked about earlier, my mother was a teenage mother, a very young teenage mother. My grandparents really had to raise me. Most parent, people thought that my grandparents had a child late in life. Um, because in those days, in the 60s, we had a very young teenage mother. It really wasn't highly looked upon. Not that it's looked upon very highly now, but it certainly wasn't looked upon very highly, a teenage girl getting pregnant at a very young age in the 60s. So my grandmother and grandfather basically took me and raised me as their own for the most part. And most people even thought that my uncle and I were brothers as opposed to him being my uncle because he's only about 12 years older than me. My grandmother and great-grandmother played significant roles in my life. A lot of people when I got involved in politics said to me, you have an old soul. Um, and I know people hear that term and they go, well, listen, you know, that I, I, I always acted and, and I was around people much older than me and always acted much older than my age. But that was because of my grandparents, um, because I was around them for the most part. My grandmother taught me everything. She taught me how to sew. She taught me how to cook. She taught me how to clean. She taught me how to wash. She taught me how to iron. She taught me if you get a hole in your socks, you don't buy new socks because we can't afford to buy new socks. My mother was on welfare. Um, 
our family were welfare recipients. We had food stamps. Um, so my grandmother would say, if you don't have a pair of socks that you, without holes in them, then you, you darn your socks, which means you sew up the hole. I've uh, had holes in my pants. She taught me how to sew, sew up the holes in my pants. Um, she taught me everything. She said, you're going to be able to do everything for yourself, young man. So my grandmother was really key in my life. And most people who know me in my life knows the importance of seniors have played in my life. Um, you know, without, without, that goes without saying. Um, but I just really want to speak to that because, um, you know, listen to me, as you talked about earlier, you know, I'm no spring chicken. <laughs> I've got an ARP card. <laughs> and I use it at movie theaters, <laughs> out on the town. Forget it. The ARP card is the best thing in the world, man. <laughs> better, better hope you can get one. Um, so the Natural Current Retirement Committee in Rochelle Village, they obviously, there are things that they need. Um, I'm told, you know, there's uh, a need for a van, a new van, to be able to take them back and forth to places, uh, even to events. Um, I'm also told that one of the biggest problems, especially of our residents in Rochelle, our seniors, is hunger. So we talk about a lot of the seniors being homeless in our community, but a lot of our seniors are, are hungry and not just homeless. So even the ones in Rochdale who have homes, they're hungry. They need to do something to make sure we provide more meals. Now there are some organizations and groups that do that, and they do that from time to time, provide meals to people in Rochdale Village. But our seniors in particular need to have an emphasis on them. So one of the things I'd like to do is to see if we can provide more funding for food in Rochdale Village. Um, I'd even like to see if we can develop a food pantry in Rochdale Village, right there, not outside of Rochdale Village, but inside of Rochdale Village. So we'd have some place for people to come and get food on a regular basis. Um, those are things I'd like to do, uh, just some of the things I'd like to do. But there are a number of things I'd like to do to assist the natural occurring in the time in the election village. Just a couple of things right there, Jimmy. Yeah, I, I, um, those are really good, you know, those are, are good ideas. As usual, it's just like a constant flow of good ideas coming from you and, and you know, just hearing your, your relationship uh, to the senior community was rooted in your upbringing. I, th I just think it just shows like how valuable um, a, 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 a community they are to you and, and advocating for them. So, um, so kudos to you for that, just because, you know, saying it earlier, how important our seniors are, I mean, the world. Um, Something okay. else I'd like to do if you want, if I could just, yeah, so yeah. my Aunt Ruby, you talk about the natural current retirement community in Rochester Village, and I can just several examples, but just something that comes to mind in particular, my Aunt Ruby, uh, my Aunt Ruby Davis, who is uh, many people call the mother of Rochester Village. Um, one of the things she did all the time was she went over to York, the natural current retirement community office, and she went over to the Rochester Senior Center, and she would go over there and talk about the services she got provided from social workers. But we need to make sure that there's really um, proper training for the social workers and the center staff, right? They should all be able to assist people from. Sometimes she would go over and she would say, I spoke to somebody, they really didn't know what to do. I spoke to somebody else and they really had a good handle of what I should be doing to be able to get services. So we gotta make sure that we conduct quarterly training um, reviews let's say, of the senior center staff, so we can make sure that everyone knows what they should know to assess our seniors. And then we've got to, you know, create um, possibly a state benefit corporation to purchase prescriptions wholesale for seniors and to conduct generic manufacturing. Because generic manufacturing will allow us to have prescriptions that they can afford. That's another issue that seniors face, the affordability of some of these prescriptions. Good, Jimmy. I just thought about some things. I thought about my Aunt Ruby and some of the things she had as big concerns for her. God bless her soul. Um, no, no, it's it's fine. I mean, you know that 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 prescription idea, that prescription conversation. It's I think it's not had enough. Um, you know, just how much money is going out of their pockets, like my grandmother, and just you know having to. Thank God they have the delivery, but before it was like you really had to pick up a lot. And, and that was a financial toll, you know, on her. So I get it. I empathize. And I'm glad that you empathize and understand, um, you know, our, how we need to uh, protect our seniors in our community. 
Well, that was an idea that Liz Warren came up with during the presidential campaign, but I like it. Uh, I thought it should be adopted. I think it should be adopted. I think it's something we should do. Agreed. 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 Um, okay. I, those are those are my subjects. You know, those are the, the real subjects that I had. And and um, you know, we go. We we talked about the seniors. And just a quick recap: we talked housing. Uh, we talked criminal justice and what that looks like in our communities. We talked youth development and education. Education, a vital conversation as well. We talked economic development and, 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 it's, and really getting money in our communities, staying in our communities. Um, just some of the stats around how quickly a dollar leaves Southeast Queens is jaw breaking. Um, and we talked about uh, you know your leadership experience and that being a foundation for not only your um, your your work as as a doctor and your dissertation, but also the lives as impact. Um, so I've got a lot of my questions out. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I'm I'm happy that you're able to to sit in for these conversation this conversation and hear a lot. But I wanted to give an opportunity for you guys to you know ask a few questions. Um, I'm going to open up the, the the line or let's unpin, and then we can. Um, then we can begin to uh, get some questions by people raising their hands. If you have the ability to raise your hand, I see one right now, um, Miss Darlene. So yes, we will have an opportunity. Let me just do another scan really quickly. Great. All right. So Darlene has a question. I would, uh, Darlene, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and go ahead and ask your question. Well, thank you for inviting me to this meeting, first off, and um, the interesting ideas that have been presented, and I um, agree with a lot of them. Um, you know, I've lived in this community for, from nine, maybe 1969, so wow. I've seen a lot happen and how it's changed and also, you know, the whole Rochdale thing, but I love the idea of the mentor because I, I'm more concerned about the youth because I feel like with there's many people that are economically sound in this community. They own homes like myself. You know, yeah. we have rental property on the homes. So, you know, and we're paying our property taxes as it goes. Oh, the thing I see as an issue is that um, with youth, if you could be, if, if, if the issue is caught before they get to a point where they are economically challenged, which is a lot of young people who have unstable homes or whatever that um, impacts them, that makes them turn towards a, a more negative um, outlook on life to keep themselves economically sound, whether that's, you know, selling drugs or whatever they do to become more um, to the attention of the criminals, um, you know, where you have to have police to have deterrence to go after uh, them when they become, make, do a criminal act instead of stopping that before they actually get to that point where they see a gang and those things as a way out of their situation. So I really am um, all for having mentorship in schools or wherever you can find it to actually redirect um, youth focus versus just going after them after they become criminals to stop the violence in that way. Because I don't, I see it as a perpetual thing that will go on from year to year to year because you never go to the root of it or even start down lower to try to stop that um, violence and, and, and way of life, you know? So we have the police, which I am not a, a, for defunding the police at all. Right. I've, you know, I, I believe we need police in our thing, but I think they need to be more community focused and more outreach to youth to, to talk them into getting into a more, um, of viable futures. So if you're going to be out there, don't go out there to so always police in a negative way, but find out what they're doing in school or whatever and refocus them to see if they can help them. Absolutely, I agree with you totally. I agree with you totally. You know, when I was younger, we had the, um, the youth council. The 113 precinct had a community youth council and mm -hmm. Officer Smitty was the guy who was the youth, the youth patrol officer. He got us involved with so many things. I wasn't even a member of the youth council. I had my own youth council with the Democratic mm -hmm. Party, which was overseen by Fred Wilson at the time. God bless his soul. And Tom mm -hmm. White was like my, my key adult that worked with us with the youth council. But mm -hmm. Smith had a great youth program over at the 113 precinct. He had kids mm -hmm. in basketball. He had all kinds of trips that he did in Dave Tillich. And his name is now um, 
proudly displayed on the corner of 100th Precinct, 150th Precinct, Basin Boulevard. Um, and, you know, Al Stevens was another great youth officer who retired at some point in time, worked for Senator Leroy Comrie as one of his oh, last right. jobs. Al Stevens did a lot with our young people, uh, another mm -hmm. friend and supporter. Um, we've got to get back to doing more of that, right? Engaging. I do, because I think people, the, the economically challenged children and families fall through the cracks and, and whether we think about it or not, you know, there's so many people in our community are doing well, you know, they have jobs. I mean, I think it's an issue with, with the wages of what people are, are, are um, paid and that's an issue as well, which I'm not sure if you're gonna address that. I know we've gotten a $15, but down the road, you know, with the inflation and how things are going up with renters and, and, and people's mortgage and property taxes, you know, it's gonna be a perpetual catch 22 because you can never catch up. Absolutely right. And, and a fair wage is always important, especially for myself and those in labor, right? We're always yeah. interested in making sure that people get a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. And yeah. you're right. And, unless you keep up with it by addressing with cost of living increases, and which we try to do within our contracts, the minimum mm -hmm. wage needs to be addressed the same way. You've got to be able to keep up with cost of living increases with cost of living expenses. Mm -hmm only do that by making sure that the salaries are adequate to address the cost of living. But that's something that you have to stay on top of every day. It can't be addressed every 20 years. Um, it's got to be addressed on a regular basis to make sure that we keep pace with the cost of living. Well, my only last question before I let someone else talk is I hope that you are able to hire enough people to address all the issues and um, suggestions that you put out because each one needs to have someone um, specifically working on that. You know, if you have a small staff, it's never going to work. Well, I'm going to say this. I think that um, I just take your point. I think that, again, we're going to take a look at the balance between a sizable staff and a small staff of extremely skilled and competent people. Mm -hmm. and we can bring on board as interns and volunteers that we can train that will help us do the work. In addition to that, I'm going to rely on people who are skilled, intelligent people from our community to help me address some problems. So I'm not a person who believes that the elected official and the staff should be the de facto leader of the community. I think you are the de facto leaders of that community and you direct the leaders that you elect to what you want them to do. And in order to be able to do that, you've got to put together committees. You've got to put together committees of people that have skills in your community, a group of people that is skilled and intelligent and knowledgeable about housing, a group of people that's skilled and knowledgeable about education, and those people can help you make the decisions. And then you begin to empower that group of people that you represent to be able to represent the community with those issues. It shouldn't mm -hmm. take me to go down to City Hall to be able to say, I'm representing this community. I should be able to send a Darling Peoples down to City Hall with a group of 25 people, and they should respect mm -hmm. Darling Peoples the same way they respect me, because I'm putting my power behind this Darling Peoples. I'm empowering mm -hmm. you to be a leader and to help me lead this community. Thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you so much, um, Miss Peoples, for such an engaging question or comments as well. Um, you know, on that subject, and just to be equitable, um, I just want to make sure that the phone callers right now, you guys know, if you want to unmute yourself, star six is the way to do it on Zoom. That's just information purposes. If you are interested in asking a question, I know, Mr. Mitchell. Um, President Mitchell from the Fred Wilson Democratic Club, I think you have a question um, or a comment or some, uh, so I want to give you space. Um, I saw your hand earlier. Uh, thank you, Jermaine. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andrews. Uh, a you. lot of information, a lot of use, youthful information. I have two questions. I'm just, I just one right now and, and later on, I want to ask the second one. Um, what part of your resume uh, do you think best prepares you to lead this community? Um, I think my, you know, although I've served in a number of roles over the years, I think my doctorate in executive leadership, um, you know, if I felt in the years past that I, I believe that I should be um, taking a more assertive role in leading this community, I probably didn't know if I had the confidence to be able to do that. But after going through a doctorate and 
executive leadership and looking at the world in preparation to receive that doctorate through the prism of social justice, I now feel I'm better prepared to lead this community. And it's possible that I was before, but I now have more confidence in not only being, to, being able to theoretically see where we need to go, but to have the vision, a vision that I can share and hopefully get people to buy into to what this community can become. Thank you. You're welcome. And the second question, that was it. Uh, if no one else has raised their hands, uh, I can't do the second question. Yeah, you can. I think we're going to give you space okay. really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about uh, the seniors in this in, in the community. I'm uh, critical. And Southeast Queens is naked when it comes to seniors. Um, and we need in Southeast Queens uh, at least one to two other senior citizens. Uh, programs uh, as well as housing. Uh, what is your vision for uh, housing seniors and, and even a, a daycare center for, for seniors? But more importantly, a center that, that will provide all of the amenities that the seniors need uh, in this area? Well, so we haven't discussed this as part of our platform, Billy, but you know, in terms of building a new senior citizen center, we do have senior citizen centers that exist, obviously, in our community. And I do believe that we should have more because we've had several that have closed. Theodora Jackson is closed, South Jamaica is closed. There are several senior citizens that have closed in our community in critical areas like downtown Jamaica and like South Jamaica houses. So I do believe we need to reopen these centers, right? Maybe not necessarily where they were before, but we need to reopen these centers in areas of need. My mother and stepfather, as you know, um, sit on the board of directors of the Brooklyn Senior Citizen Center, just as you chair a senior, or just as you're the president of the Senior Citizen Center. So I do believe it's important, but I also believe it's critically important for us to fund senior housing. As I talked about affordable housing, we need to have affordable senior housing also. And I don't know if I've mentioned that before, but if I did, I need to stress that is part of our platform. We want to build new affordable senior housing. There's not enough senior housing, and there's certainly not enough affordable senior housing. With some of the senior housing developments in this district, and the prices that, I mean, the money that people pay for rent. Some developments, eighteen hundred dollars for a two-bedroom apartment. I mean, that's more than than most of us are paying for a two-bedroom apartment. And this for seniors on a limited income. So we've got to be able to build more affordable senior housing. Building. Great, thank you, thank you, Billy. Thank you, Dr. Andrews. Um, I want to recognize Tom, who has a question. Feel free to um, unmute yourself and ask. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Judge. Oh, from oh, you, there's an old poker term. You're touching the money. Don't touch the money <laughs> till it's over. <laughs> We're gonna Good evening, Dr. Andrews. We're going to put it in air. We're going to speak positively. Thank you. Thank you. I like positive reinforcement. So um, I, I know personally, um, as president of Latino Lawyers, how you have been involved in getting more Latinos and people of color onto the bench. Um, and uh, I just wanted to know if elected, um, how do you see that evolving and going forward in terms of keeping this line? Because we've got a line going now uh, that's been the, the process of a lot of work from a lot of people, you included, um, to change the, the complexion of the bench in Queens, which is still lacking in so many ways. If elected, what is your plan going forward to try and keep that line going? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. So, you know, something I talked about with Jason Clark the other day, um, he was the head of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, you know, and, and Nathan Bialin. I talked to somebody the other day, my cousin Ronnie, um, who used to be the president, Ronald Land, used to be the president of the Nathan Bialin Black Bar Association. And of course, you and I work close together as president of the Latino Lawyers Association. What do we have to do? One of the things we have to do is we have to make sure that we get young attorneys trained to know that 
we got to get them to understand, first of all, that there's an opportunity for them in Queens that has never presented itself, never presented itself before. Um, since Congressman Meeks, the county leader, has come into the position of the Queens County Executive Committee Chair, we have had more people of color to be placed on the bench than ever before. But we've got to get people to understand that there's a process, there's a structure for getting people on the bench. So most people don't know, most attorneys don't know, well, how would I even, how would I even think about becoming a judge? The Metropolitan Black Bar Association has been conducting workshops, training young attorneys and teaching young attorneys, um, talking to them about the steps that are required to put themselves in a position to be one day considered to be able to be on the bench. I think we've got to do more of that. We've got to do more of that with your organizations, and we've got to make sure that the organizations that are surrounding the Bar Association and the Lawyers Association continue to work to identify people that would be good judges and make good jurists on the bench in Queens County. And one of the things that I would do as I work even closer as an elected public official with each one of these orders, the Latino Lawyers, the Bacon Bialan, the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, and all of the other bar associations and organizations that are trying to work to get people of color to be on the bench. We talked about it for years. You're right. Now there's a pipeline for getting it done, but now we have to get people prepared to be able to go into that pipeline and to get people encouraged to know that they can actually become a judge. And of course, we've got to get some people to think about public service. Not everybody wants to go that route, Tom, as you and I both know. Some of our journeys feel that they make more money in private practice. But there's a reason, a good reason, to have more people come on the bench. And that's because they identify with the people who come before that courtroom. They can identify, identify with other people, but they can certainly identify with people of color coming through that courtroom and be able to make more informed decisions before decisions are rendered. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, thank you for that great question, um, Tom. Uh, I, I see there's a question in the chat. Um, actually, somebody private messaged me a question. So if you can answer that really quickly, and then right after that, there's a question about the Senior Citizen Center. Um, so the question that I got in the chat was, we just survived the pandemic and you worked at a Queens hospital. What do you want to do about healthcare in our community? You know, first of all, there's a healthcare disparity, right? And chairing the board of Queens Hospital Center Community Advisory Board. Um, I've learned about this disparity, but nowhere has it been more present than the pandemic. We had more people of color pass away in our communities of color than throughout the city, than other areas throughout the city. Southeast Queens was particularly hit hard. Far Rockaway, Southeast Queens, um, Elmhurst was hit very hard. We've got to make sure that we have good health care in these communities. And we've got to make sure that we address this by, if we have to put satellites in these communities from the public hospital system, which deals with the indigent and poor, that we can put satellites in these communities. And we got to deal with issues that are impacting our communities of color. Asthma, birth defects, low birth weight. These are all issues that affect us, affect us disproportionately for a number of different reasons. So, We've got to do something to address these particular issues, diabetes, cancer. We have a cancer treatment center and a, and a center of excellence for diabetes at the Queens Hospital Center. We've got to make sure that our healthcare facilities in our areas of color are addressing these issues appropriately. Whether we create centers of excellence or we make sure we get into the communities and we educate people about healthy choices, about smoking cessation. Um, I think those are things that we, we can do to address the healthcare disparity, obviously. And I'm very informed on these issues because I've chaired the board uh, for several years and served on the hospital board in Queens Hospital Center and also chaired the council of all community advisory boards and the health and hospital system. Um, so I'm very informed about these issues and healthcare disparity and what we need to do to address this. So these are just a few things that I can think of with the top of my head that I've been talking about. Thank you for that. Um, here's another question that's in the chat. We have a senior citizen center in South Jamaica that we have been fighting for years to get open. How can you assist us in getting this done? Thank you for that question. So again, you know, the funding wasn't there. 
and, and unfortunately it closed several years ago. And I talked about this a bit earlier. Whether it's right in the middle of the NYCHA houses in South Jamaica, or it's another center that opened up in South Jamaica, without Theodora Jackson, without South Jamaica houses, there are no senior citizen centers on that side of Guybrook Boulevard. Um, well, or actually on that side of Sutton Boulevard, let's say, in South Jamaica. So we need to open up a new senior citizen center there. We've got to first get the funding though. So it's something that I'll fight for. I'll fight to see if we can get more senior citizen centers open up, especially in those areas where we lost them due to funding. Great. Um, uh, if you hear uh, uh, a child in the background, my daughter has arrived home. Uh, so it's not gonna be as quiet, but um, I want to leave space here for one more question. If there is one more question, um, just giving others an opportunity to ask. Once again, on your cell phone, if you'd like to ask a question um, and you are on cell phone, please feel free to press star six. I hope that's the one that works. Um, star six to unmute yourself um, on Zoom and ask your question. So just give a few seconds. All right, no other questions. Great, this was a really informative conversation, Dr. Andrews. Um, participants, thank you for joining us. There's some announcements, so please do not do not leave just yet. I want to leave space for Dr. Andrews to address you all um, with his closing remarks. You know, I hate long meetings, Jermaine, so I'm glad that we were able to do this, but I don't want to take this and, and prolong it too much. I'm glad I got a chance to meet the constituents. This is something that we want to do. Um, on a regular basis. We wanna have these town hall discussions. This is not gonna be the last one. This is something I wanna do once we're in office and we'll speak that into existence too. I wanna to make sure that we have regular town hall meetings. I wanna make sure that we bring the civic associations together. I wanna to create more civic associations. I wanna create more block associations, more tenant associations so that we can come together and have these discussions virtually and in person. And so I wanna make sure that we have a zone meetings like in this particular zone, Zone one with South Jamaica, downtown South Jamaica, that we have a regular meeting with Zone One to discuss issues of concern, to bring in the other services that are needed to be able to address those issues, whether it be child welfare, whether it be the police enforcement. I want to make sure that we do these meetings on a regular basis. So again, if you didn't ask we'll plenty of other times that we'll have questions that can be addressed at other town hall meetings. This is a great start. I want to thank you, Jermaine, for giving me an opportunity to be able to talk about these things, just as you've done in your podcast with this town hall discussion. So, you know, really quickly, I would hate to leave Melissa Hill. She has a question here. If you could just limit this. I know you kind of talked talk to Hill about it a little bit earlier, but if we could just get a 20 second response, um, how would you assist in more food in South Jamaica for the seniors? Well, we have a hungry desert, right? So we've got to be able to, to focus on getting more funding for pantries. I can't tell you during this pandemic, how many pantries I heard about that were closing or didn't have enough food. Uh, Pastor Doris Johnson reached out to me and said she wasn't able to get food for several weeks. She had people waiting online that could not get food. So what I did was I reached out to the borough president's office and at the time got Sharon Lee who was the acting borough president to reach back to the city agencies to make sure that we provided food for that food pantry, which is located on the other side of Rockley Boulevard in South Ozone Park. So we've got to make sure we get properly funded food pantries and to make sure that we don't have another situation. God forbid another pandemic where we have a lack of food, but we live in a hunger desert. That's something people need to realize. In the midst of being Southeast Green, which is one of the highest poverty indexes in the community and in, in the city, I should say, and in the country, we have South Jamaica, which is one of the lowest poverty indexes. And so we do have a hunger desert. So we've got to make sure we provide adequate funding for more food pantries in our community. York College has one, so people should know about the York College food pantry, but we've got a lot of work to get to that point. And we gotta make sure we never have a situation again where people are going hungry during a pandemic or at any, any other place. Indeed, indeed. Um, okay, thank you all for joining us. Um, there are some announcements that I'd like to make. We are not in Sunday service, 
but uh, there are some announcements. If the graphics can be put up, thank you very much. So if you can, for those on the phone, those that can't hear, um, we have, as you, you know, we went through the conversation today, we touched on a lot of different subjects in a very um, macro level sometimes. Sometimes Dr. Andrews went in and spoke um, in detail with some ideas, but here we have an opportunity on different dates throughout the, 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 um, the next few months uh, to, to stop in on Zoom wherever you are, uh, to listen in on the specific subject lines that Dr. Andrews would like to have the conversation with, um, with our community about. First, quality of life happening Saturday, May 7th at 6 p.m. Second, housing and seniors, very important subject. Tuesday, May 17th at 7 p.m. Once again, housing and seniors, Tuesday, May 17th at 7 p.m. Youth and education, um, youth development education, Saturday, May 21st at 6 p.m. Jobs and public safety, safety, Friday, June 3rd at 7 p.m. We'd hope that we're going to get this information to you via email, via the different ways that you've gotten in touch with Dr. Andrews, making sure that you know, you're aware of what's happening. Um, um, it's very important that you find subjects. If it's all of them, great, join us. We'd love to have that conversation. But it's also very important to start inviting your neighbors, the people that care about the community, our community, just the same way. Please invite them out to just hear, have, hear what, what the ideas are. Um, if it's in line with a vision that you can see our community is looking like that Dr. Andrews has for our community, that this will be an opportunity for those people to stop in as well. Um, you know, we had a very nice tight program today. I'm very excited about the questions that we received. It really speaks to what's going on. But uh, there are there is another opportunity for everyone to listen in to more of what Dr. Andrews has been saying. The title of um, my podcast is Sequence the Podcast. Dr. Andrews was a guest. I put the link in the, um, the chat. So when you click that, it'll lead you to that interview and at your convenience, you can listen in, hear about his backstory, hear about things that he believes are important. This conversation happened over a year ago and I tell you, it still resonates till this day currently um, just because you know he has been doing the work. So stop in and listen to that. Make sure you, you check in for our conversations our, where we go in depth on those specific subjects that we spoke about earlier. It's exciting times. The ground is swelling, change is upon us, and we're excited to have you join us for the conversation so you can meet this candidate, meet our candidate, Dr. Anthony Andrews Jr. Thank you all for joining. Did I leave out anything, moderators? No? We are good. Vote Dr. Dr. Anthony Andrews on Tuesday, the most important thing on Tuesday, June 28th. Early voting starts Saturday, June 18th to Sunday, June 26th. Once again, um, vote for Dr. Andrews on Tuesday, June 28th. Early voting starts on the, the 18th to June um, to Sunday, June 26th. Uh, we'd love to have you guys join us in the other conversations. Thank you all so much for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful and pleasant evening, and we look forward to speaking to you at the next virtual town hall. Have a great one, everyone. Thanks a lot, everybody. Good to see everybody. I look forward to talking to you out there in the community. Have a great night.